超。I would like to. Please, I'd like to offer a moment of silence for the people of Joplin, Missouri, who were um, hit by that tornado last night. Thank you. Um, tonight we're going to start with 39. I pray fast. Yeah, I pray fast. Um, tonight we're going to start with 39, which is basically a lot like 38 with one or two little differences. So um, if it was said once before, moderate your discussions. And if you have something new to add, but I can't take lists yet. Um, if you have something new to add, then by all means. Otherwise, it's just going to get up and say the same thing. Maybe we can move it through, and if possible, we could possibly finish up everything except the budgets and the other things that are going to be tabled till after their override. Um, are there any town meeting members who have yet to be sworn in? None. I uh, recognize the Chairman of the Board of Sele Selectmen, Ms. Rowe. Thank you, Mr. Moore. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, so we're going to come back Wednesday. Any announcements or resolutions? <coughs> Mr. McCabe. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Harry McCabe, Precinct 21. Mr. Moderator, the Council on Aging would like to invite all of you to a health fair on Saturday, June 18th at 1230. Admission is free in this hall. I've left uh, copies of this for everyone on the back table there. And if you can't come, please send a neighbor or, the, or a member of the family. I think you'll be surprised. Thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions? Seeing none, any reports or committees? No committee reports. Okay, then we're going to go right into 39. The next on our list is Mr. John Warden. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Warden, Precinct 8. Um, I'd like to um, move a, an amendment next. to the uh, motion of the Board of Selectmen, uh, and I We'll hand it to you now. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, and the amendment, which is ooh, on the screen, in very large type, even I can see it. No, that's for 38. We want 39 and maybe slightly smaller type. Um, Anyway, basically, th th this, is, uh, this is identical to the motion that I made <coughs> under Article 38, uh, which inserts uh, some language into the Selectman's motion, um, uh, which shall be conveyed by deed, which, and half the word use, uh, the, word for, the words for at least 30 years. And uh, can we have that? Who's in charge here? I don't know. Maybe we'll get to it. <coughs> anyway, the, um, and, then, and there are some paper copies at the back of the hall. We ran off quite a large number of them, and um, th there are quite a, quite a few left, um, so feel free. <coughs> um, excuse me. Uh, as in the case of Article 38, I do not favor the sale of the Crosby School, but if you do vote by two-thirds to sell it, the sale should be restricted so as to provide some protection to the neighborhood, a neighborhood that has already been threatened 
by a 40B development on the other side of Winter Street. The other night it was asserted that I am against affordable housing, and that's why I put this restriction in, even though all my amendment would do is put some much needed teeth into the motion put forward by the Board of Selectmen. Arlington already has affordable housing programs to provide such housing without overriding our zoning law bylaw protections. And they provide housing which is affordable for people who really need it. The, the housing authorities buildings, the Housing Corp Corporation of Arlington's program of purchasing and rehabbing existing housing stock and the exclusionary, inclusionary zoning bylaw enacted by this town meeting, which requires 15% of any development of six or more units must be available to people at 60% of median income. And this is an important distinction because 40B projects, you have to have at least 80% of median. If you want to accuse someone of being against affordable housing, take a look at Article 13 in your warrant fortunately voted no action in the earlier session of this meeting, which would have eviscerated our inclusionary zoning bylaw. Some people have been duped into believing that 40B is synonymous with affordable housing. The result of a $1 million developer finance campaign against question two on last November's ballot, which would have repealed 40B. $1 million seems like a lot of money, uh, but it's only 1% of the $100 million in illicit profits made by 40B developers over the past few years, according to the Inspector General, which, by the way, includes $500,000 of excess profits on the, 40, uh, the 40B on Brattle Street, which was supposed to come to the town of Arlington, but we never got the money. The, f the First Amendment, and this is uh, going back, it was circulated, that I proposed would have dealt <clears throat> with, with this threat by requiring a reversion of the Crosby School property to the town if any subsequent owner tried to go the 40B route. <clears throat> I, did, I did not put forward that amendment. A reversion for violation of, of, of a provision in a properly drafted deed is perfectly legal uh, and was recently upheld by the court in a case decided in Barnstable County. I abandoned that proposed amendment when I saw that the selectmen seemed to be moving in somewhat the right direction. Now listen carefully to this quote. Because Arlington has less than 10% affordable housing, state law, so-called 40B, would allow a developer to pack in residential units, ignoring local zoning restrictions on height and density, so long as he makes 25% available as affordable housing. The town would be powerless to prevent this gross overbuilding from happening. Now that isn't John Worden speaking. That's the Arlington Board of Selectmen in the same document that I referred to the other night in connection with promoting the over, over debt exclusion for the Sims project. When someone stands on the floor of this meeting and says she isn't in favor of 40B, but just a few months ago, in the run-up to the November election, signed on as a supporter of the No on Two campaign, that is, as a supporter of the corrupt 40B law, in published advertisements, is she trying to kid us, or like the warrant closing date, did she just forget? When the Board of Selectmen and their supporters tell us they don't like my 30-year restriction to educational uses because they need flexibility, I get nervous. Ms. LaCourte stated that no change in use would occur unless the, quote, the owner, the Board of Selectmen, and the community as a whole agree. How does she, who has promised to leave the board next year, propose to determine what the whole community wants? Here are some options. <clears throat> Hold a hearing at which all the comments are heard and then the board does what they were going to do anyway. Hold a monster meeting in this hall which both sides would try to pack, and then take a straw vote? No. <laughs> the only way to determine what the whole community wants is to put the question on the ballot or to consult this town meeting. So if they want flexibility, let someone move to amend my amendment by adding, this restriction may be modified by a two-thirds vote of town meeting. Simple as that. <clears throat> For the purpose of my amendment, 
Something we owe to the residents of the Crosby neighborhood is to ensure that in the event of any subsequent sale of, these, of this property, they will be limited to educational use because it would be right there in the deed. We have already protected the Parmenter neighborhood, and thank you for doing that, by keeping the, t the school as town property. The people in the Crosby neighborhood deserve no less. So if you're in favor of selling the Crosby school, please vote for my amendment to give the neighborhood the protection they deserve. If you're against selling, as I am, please vote for my amendment in case the other side wins. At least the neighborhood will have some level of protection. And then, most importantly, vote no on the final vote on Article 39. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. McCabe. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Harry McCabe, Precinct 21. I don't think we need to beat you to death again over this article. Uh, I think it, it's the same issue that we discussed uh, in a previous article. The, the important thing we need to remember is, the most important thing, that the rebuild of the Thompson School has nothing to do with this, nothing. Zero. A previous speaker under Article 38 uh, made a good case for uh, maintaining our options. Well, if we sell this property, we have no options. So I don't understand uh, the particular person's logic and uh, I'm not attacking him personally, I just don't understand the logic. The way to maintain our options is to maintain uh, ownership of this property. So as I said, I don't intend to beat you to death over this. Uh, you very wisely uh, voted no on Article 38, and I recommend the same and strongly that you vote no on Article 39. Uh, you're going to hear arguments that attempt to convince us that Article 39 is different. Well, in some sense, in some respects, it is different. But the bottom line is not different. The bottom line is the same. If we sell this property, it's gone forever. So with that, I would thank you very much for your courtesy and apologize to anybody who may have been upset over any remarks that I may have made under Article 38. Uh, there was no intention uh, to malign anybody. I believe everybody uh, has been acting in good faith here, and I believe that we uh, need to respect uh, everybody's opinion. Everybody's. And I thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Mr. Dosha. Good evening, Joyce Radoja, Precinct 11. I was just going to come and stand before you and say, hello, I would like to ask permission for Dr. Ted Wilson, uh, who is president of Schools for Children, of which Dearborn Academy uh, is a program. I think Dr. Wilson can speak for himself, uh, but I do want to say maybe 20 seconds worth of what's going on in my mind. I have worked at Dearborn Academy for 23 years. I have owned property on Winter Street for 45 years. 
I have a daughter, son-in-law, and a two-year-old granddaughter who live on Winter Street. And right now, I am thinking not in terms of just money, and I know I should, my husband scolds me that I don't always put money first. I am thinking of the long-term stability of a neighborhood. A school really adds that extra special something to a neighborhood. We live up the street from Bishop School, even though sometimes the traffic um, at, when school gets out uh, can be challenging, it's still a wonderful place to live near a school. And I think you have heard uh, various times, various uh, locations that the neighbors on Oxford and Winter Street love Dearborn Academy and love them as neighbors. Now I would like to again ask permission for Dr. Ted Wilson to make his case for it's, staying either through the sale of the building, through the purchase of the building, or through some kind of a favorable lease. Is Dr. Wilson a resident of the town? Does he live in Arlington? No, he lives in Winchester. Okay, so we have to ask the uh, meeting. All in favor of having Dr. Wilson address the meeting, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Do Dr. Wilson, come on in. Uh, Mr. Moderator and town meeting members, thank you uh, for allowing me to speak tonight. I'm Ted Wilson, President and Executive Director of Schools for Children, and I want to just uh, take a few minutes to talk about Article 39, not with an attempt to sway anybody's vote on anything, but to tell you what it means to us. Uh, the result of what you'll be deliberating has, I believe, a direct and major impact on the services we provide to our students. We're an Arlington-based nonprofit dedicated to serving a wide range of students with a variety of high quality educational programs. We currently operate out of three old school buildings leased to us by the town of Arlington. Since 1983, we've been renting the entire Crosby building for our highly regarded special education school, Dearborn Academy. We also rent a significant amount of space in the Gibbs building for the Leslie Ellis School. In addition, we rent space in the central school for administrative offices and a small um, diagnostic program. In total, we rent over 60,000 square feet from the town of Arlington. We are one of the uh, largest private employers in town with 150 employees serving over 300 students from over 40 communities. Our economic impact within Arlington is significant and we very much want to continue operating here. As you begin to discuss this article, it's important for me to be clear on one key point. We would support any article that paves the way for the town to make a permanent decision on the future of the Crosby Building and gives us the best chance to compete successfully to buy the building. Schools for Children, uh, our, our main goal at this point is to find permanent facilities for both of our Arlington-based schools. <laughs> That's a key part of our overall long-term plan because without such homes, our schools essentially are vulnerable to the vicissitudes of, of uh, the rental life. It would be a major disruption for us and a significant loss for the town as well if we were to have to move. We believe our presence provides a direct economic benefit of the town, en enhances property values, and adds to the, des the desirability of living in Arlington. So our strong preference is to, is to purchase the building. Why is that our preference? Simply put, it's taken our organization 20 years to mature to a point where we actually have the resources where we could complete such a step. And it's very important for us that we change the feeling of vulnerability and instability that comes from being a tenant rather than an owner. This has never been more of an issue than over the past three years. Our school is licensed by the state and has a tuition set by the Commonwealth. It's been in flux since 2008. We went from having long-term leases and predictable rent increases tied to the CPI to a very unnerving and unpredictable situation. Let me describe what happened. We've operated on a series of five and 10-year leases since 1983. Our last 10-year lease was due to expire at the end of June 2008. In December of 2007, six months before the end of that lease, the town published the RFP seeking a tenant for the Crosby. It offered a three-year lease 
and included target rental rates. Six months before our lease was to end, in other words, when there was no time to consider looking elsewhere, we learned that the only acceptable response to the RFP was one where we agreed to a minimum of a 52.8% rent increase, or a preferred doubling of that same rent over the three-year term. It kind of took our, uh, took, our <laughs> took our by surprise, to say the least. There, there was really no way that we could find, uh, acquire, and equip a new specialized school and move before the end of that lease. So essentially, we were uh, kind of uh, stuck in submitting a response that met that minimum term. We agreed to sign a lease with that 52.8% increase, and we signed that lease 12 days before the last lease was due to run out. We also immediately began seeking alternatives to remaining at the Crosby. The fact that we're still here reflects our ongoing hope that somehow we'll have a chance to remain at the Crosby on a much more permanent basis. But we obviously can't afford to just sit and wait. In fact, two years ago, we entered a bid to buy another building in another town and would have moved had the bid been accepted. We've recently hired outside help in the search for alternatives, even while remaining very clear that our first preference is to buy the Crosby and stay in Arlington. From what I heard last week in the Parmenter discussion, our future in the Crosby building could be very much in doubt, and we should be aggressively trying to find a new space. Those are my observations from last week's town meeting. I heard that there were suggestions that this building is a pot of gold and that the town should just ratchet up the rent and add the cost of all capital improvements to the tenant's cost. You can certainly do that, but Dearborn Academy can barely afford the current rent. It's highly unlikely that we'd sign any extension that includes rent increases beyond the CPI. You should know that Dearborn is working with some of the most challenging students in the Commonwealth, that their faculty is earning 25 to 30 percent less than their public school counterparts, and that they have no option to raise their tuition without Commonwealth approval. Indeed, their tuition has been frozen for the past three years. We're definitely not going to be in a position to sign any lease that both raises the rent dramatically and includes an expectation that we fund all future capital improvements for this 115-year-old building. Maybe there's a group out there who would agree to do this, but I have to be very clear that it simply can't be our organization. While your responsibility is to manage this building to the maximum benefit to the town of Arlington, my responsibility is to provide within our means a stable learning environment for these kids. The second point, and very much related to the first, I heard only a limited awareness of the magnitude of the capital needs facing any occupancy of the Crosby. Just a, a, a few bits of what I know, having lived there for the past 28 years. We know that exterior bricks are falling out of the walls, allowing water to erode the structure. We know the roof leaks on a regular basis, the steam pipes buried beneath the floors rupture frequently, and the heating system is barely functional. Not satisfied to simply use our own experience as a guide, we hired an architectural firm to do a complete infrastructure review. We have a very clear sense of what to expect going forward, and their preliminary results have expanded on the above list. The building has significant accessibility issues and could easily require an elevator to be installed. This would be a huge concern for anybody coming into the building. There are issues with the electrical and fire alarm systems and the HVA system, to quote the architect, does not meet current ventilation requirements for habitation. I don't want to tell that to my staff. The list goes on, but you get the point. Whoever owns this building must anticipate spending significant dollars in the years to come. Third, many figures are being used to justify the arguments for either selling the building or continuing to lease it. Some very smart people are debating these two points of view. From my perspective, both sides of the debate are offering arguments using best guesses about market rent rates and market values to justify their particular point of view. I think the reality in this building is that it's been offered to the rental market several times over the past quarter century, and the market has responded. We've been the only bidders for almost three decades. Obviously, this could change this time around, but you won't really know until the property is offered, either for sale or for rent. We do know, however, that in the current economic times, it's dangerous to make assumptions about the market. Yet, we're being, these, these assumptions are being made, and I think they're driving the debates. Three key assumptions that I've heard. Number one, that the town will be able to easily and quickly identify a tenant who is both willing and able to pay an escalating rent of as much as 10% per year for the next 10 years, and 
be responsible for all capital improvements for the next 20 to 30 years. I've already clearly stated that this will be necessarily someone other than your current tenant, as that approach will absolutely price us out of this market. Second assumption. Doctor, you almost done? I am, yep, within a page. Thank okay. you. Okay. That financial projections based on the proposed long-term rental scenarios are immune to the possibility of any downside risk. Graphs and spreadsheets look very different with no revenue entering the picture for any time the building stands empty. Surely the Sims project provides ample warning of the need to consider risk in any analysis. Final assumption, that there are numerous entities willing, interested, and able to make bona fide offers to purchase the building under the restrictions cited in the warrant article and within the time frame desirable to the town of Arlington. The hope is that such competition will drive the price to desirable levels. That may or may not be possible. Nobody knows who will emerge in response to an RFP to buy or lease the building. Charter schools and 40B developers were but two that were mentioned last week. You simply don't know who will respond when that door is opened. So in conclusion, I can offer two facts to ways you consider your options. The current Crosby tenant, which occupies 100% of that building, is ready, willing, and able to cement a permanent relationship with the town of Arlington by purchasing the building. If you're concerned about the long-range future of the current school in place at the Crosby, you might remember that I've already said that we have two schools needing permanent homes. The Crosby would work well for either of them. Selling to us makes it extremely unlikely you would ever have to deal with the reuse restrictions noted in the substitute article. Second, we have no issue with the restrictions contained in the selectman substitute. Yeah, Doc, come on, you have to we're, finish up. We're no, <laughs> just sum up, please. The final summary, we very much want to have all of our operations remain in Arlington. We'd be uh, a tenant or, a, or an owner that would create a win-win solution for the, uh, the neighborhood, the schools, and the town. Thank, Thank you, you for listening. Mr. Berger? I let him go on because I thought he was almost done. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Eric Berger, uh, Precinct 6. I'm going to urge you to vote for a substitute motion that I have put out today for you, uh, for Article 39, for the following reasons. Uh, you might think that this is inconsistent with the position I took in Article 39, where there, but the, the commonality is that I think we need to honor uh, the tenant of the of both schools and uh, not, not to um, shortchange the town, but to honor the tenant. And that was true in Article 38 and it's true in Article 39. And so I'm urging a support of my motion for the, uh, for the following reasons. Yeah. As, as stated, the Dearborn Academy has been an outstanding tenant and steward in this town with the Crosby School Building for 28 years. It's invested over half a million dollars since 1983 in necessary capital improvements to the building's interior. To name but a few, these include uh, a hardwood gym floor, expansion of the school kitchen, and adding lifts to much of the building to make it handicap accessible. Furthermore, the academy has agreed to in the past and currently is under a lease that has a triple net basis clause. Therefore, not only does the Dearborn Academy right now assume responsibility for the cost of heating, electricity, and water, it has also been willing to be responsible for the cost of maintaining the building, an issue that was brought up last week at the meeting, and adjacent yard and gardens. Furthermore, the Academy has invested in exterior brick and stone repairs. The second reason is that we heard tonight, the Dearborn Academy has established an excellent relationship with its neighbors, particularly on Oxford and Winter Streets, two streets in the immediate uh, surrounding community. It's also helped beautify the area by planting shrubs, trees, etc. Three, Dearborn Academy enjoys a first-rate reputation for a long time as an educational institution for children with special needs. It has very small class sizes and a highly individualized instructional approach comprehensive curriculum. And as such, the Dearborn Academy provides a valuable knowledge resource for our own public schools as they seek the best ways to educate children of all ages of special needs in the district. The more you can educate special education children in a variety of options in your own district, the less costly it is. 
the Dearborn Academy supports the Arlington Public Schools effort to do all it can to educate locally its special education population so they don't have to be sent away. Mr. Berger, yes. I'm going to ask you to move to one of the other mics. That one's not going out over to TV land. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. So um, partnering with the Dearborn Academy to create more options within its special education programming milieu can help keep more children in our home environment, which could reduce costs. Such partnering doesn't simply mean sending the students to Dearborn Academy. These students could be educated in the Arlington Public School buildings through partnership with the Dearborn Academy. And that partnership is going to be made a lot more difficult if the Dearborn Academy leaves and goes somewhere else. As you heard, Dearborn Academy is part of the Schools for Children organization, with the Leslie Ellis School as, as the other one. Now, they, you heard tonight, they want to remain in Arlington. They want to stay here. However, the organization you've heard has reached an evolutionary point where the stability afforded by owning the Crosby School building in an agreement that's acceptable to the town, of course, is vitally needed for the continued health and upward trajectory of the organization. This organization has saved enough resources to make a very serious and financially sound proposal. Of course, it has to be uh, acceptable to the town, but they're prepared to make it. They, they have uh, the money to make it. Now, if there is serious competition to buy the Crosby School Building, my substitute motion honors the excellence of the long tenancy of the Dearborn Academy in that building by giving the schools for children organization the opportunity or the right of first refusal. In that way, the School for Children organization could match or beat someone else's best offer. And I think that's the least you can do for an organization that's been in town for 28 years. I mean, they have, you heard how many employees they have. They've been, you know, they've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars locally to our businesses over these years, these employees. So I, I maintain that my motion honors the loyalty of the schools for children uh, to our town. It speaks to fairness, it speaks to loyalty and equity. And you heard they're looking for another place if they have to. They need some long-term commitment. And it would be a shame for us to lose this school. The time is now, I say, to, to resolve the matter for the good of our town. Because we, you know we've talked before about assets and resources. If we lose this school, We've lost an, an important asset in more ways than one. And, and I say we honor their, their request and negotiate uh, the sale of the school and give them the right of first refusal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Ms. Rice, I have a question. Um, can you speak to the legal enforceability and legality of this? Because we're now into land use and everything else. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Juliana Rice, Town Council. Um, I was just handed this. I haven't had a chance to um, consider it at length or to discuss it with the proponent. Um, but the way I see it, there are, there are two ways to apply it, one of which would be illegal, the other of which would actually be harmful to the current tenant. Um, the right of first refusal idea is one in which um, a price is reached between an owner of a property and a third party. And then the party with the right of first refusal has the opportunity to purchase the property at that price. Um, that is, if we went to the um, request for, to a request for proposal, the town reached uh, a deal with a third party, then schools for children would have the opportunity under um, this amendment to meet that price. I don't think that's what's intended. I think uh, what's intended is that schools for children be allowed to bid on its own um, on its own without having to meet a price of a third party that might be artificially inflated. Under the Uniform Procurement Act, the town, after going through the request for proposal process, may select someone other than the highest bidder. It just has to publish a notice of the reasons it's selecting that bidder. Um, if this amendment were put into place uh, without um, going through the request for proposal process, that would be illegal. So um, although I understand the intention, I don't, I think if it were to be applied, it would actually probably be harmful to the current tenant. Thank you. Did I have a second on this motion? Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Sh Sir.
Dan Dunn, Precinct 21. Do we have this in writing? I haven't. I yep. Mean, uh, yes. Okay, I apologize. When was it passed out? Uh, this evening. I think this one right there. Oh, I guess it's a minor. Here. It's a minor, small change. That's we've been allowing those. So Thank it's you. Not I just hadn't seen it in writing. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, Mr. Schlickman. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate on all matters before the article. Yes. Motion to terminate debate on all matters before the article made by Mr. Schlickman. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. My opinion is not two thirds. Mr. Kaplan. Oh, Ms. Kaplan, sorry. Go ahead. You had your hand raised last week? Or well, which one? Who? Yes, Mr. Kaplan had his hand raised, yes. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Bill Kaplan, Precinct 6. Uh, I am opposed to the idea of selling the, uh, the Crosby School. Uh, it's an asset to the town, and uh, once we sell it, it's gone. Um, I think there's all these suggestions of limitations we can put on the purchase. Uh, I'm not sure any of those are actually enforceable. Um, if we sell to the Crosby School or to the Dearborn Academy for $1.3 million, and six months later a developer offers them $5 million, uh, what are we going to do? We're not going to buy it back for five million. Um, I don't know that we're going to litigate to stop that. Uh, Dearborn Academy has a responsibility to, you know, themselves, their board, uh, you know, to, to make the best financial deal they can. Um, the town of Arlington doesn't have that responsibility to Dearborn. Uh, so, of course, Dearborn wants to buy it. 1.3 million is a great price for a large chunk of land that's walking distance to Alewife, uh, steps to two bus lines. Uh, I mean, it's, of course they want to buy it. Uh, and I don't really understand they, 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 they can't afford to keep renting it if, if the rent includes the cost of maintenance, but they can afford to buy it and perform all the maintenance. Uh, it doesn't really make sense. Um, I mean, obviously, that's, it would be financially favorable for them to, to buy the property. Uh, Arlington right now is, is in a financial crisis. Uh, we're about to ask for a giant override, and maybe now is not the time to be making donations to, to uh, private schools, no matter how worthy they are. Uh, we're all free to make a donation to Dearborn Academy. They're, it's tax deductible. Uh, it doesn't mean the town should be doing it. Um, honestly, I, I mean, I kind of think we should be finding, you know, finding a way to make more money off the property. Uh, at the very least, though, we should be breaking even and holding on to it so that at least we have the option to make money in the future. Uh, selling it now for, you know, not what it's worth, uh, it just seems remarkably irresponsible. Uh, I think, you know, if we like Dearborn Academy and we want to keep them in that space because they're good neighbors, we can keep renting it to them for what is really a, a bargain price. I mean, if, if, if our town management is saying that we, we may not actually be able to afford to rent it out, we're losing money, that's a pretty good deal for the tenant. Uh, if we can find a way to break even, and continue renting to them, that's still a pretty good deal for them. Uh, and at least in 10 years, if we need that land or if we want to sell it uh, for top dollar, we could still do that. Uh, I guess that's, that's pretty much it. I just feel like this is not the time to be making a major donation uh, to a private institution, no matter how worthy it might be. Uh, I, I urge you to, to hold on to this property uh, and uh, you know, we'll see what the future holds. Thank you, Mr. Kaplan. Um, Mr. Rearig? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Brian Rearig, Precinct 8. I am generally in favor of the town holding on to its hard assets. Um, we don't know what our needs are going to be in the future, and they are not replaceable. That's generally how I feel. Um, I also feel that this is a special case. I feel that Schools for Children, for all the reasons that you've heard tonight, is a valuable um, part of the fabric of this community and a valuable economic engine to the community. At 150 employees, I believe it's either the third or fourth largest employer in town. Uh, The special circumstances here include the fact that 
um, that Schools for Children has expressed its, its fervent desire to buy the building. And the previous speaker rightly raised the question of why a nonprofit like Schools for Children could uh, afford to buy the building and can't afford to lease the building at an equivalent market rate. And I think the reason is fairly straightforward. Having been through this with a couple of nonprofits, it's easier to run a capital campaign to buy something than it is to fund operations year after year after year after year. And so I, I accept the, the uh, assertion the schools for children can afford to buy the building, and I also accept their assertion that they will be looking for space elsewhere if they're unable to buy the building. And under those circumstances, I think that, which are very different in my mind from the circumstances at the Parmeter School, um, I support giving schools for children and the town the opportunity to come together on a, on a sale that makes sense for the long term. Um, I also, uh, I, I'm going to disagree with the previous speaker's assertion that if a uh, developer came along a few years from now that schools for children having bought the building could, um, in the face of this, of what's proposed tonight, um, resell it at a significant profit. If they could find another educational institution to resell it to at a significant profit, well, perhaps that would be the case. But we are looking here at, um, at a vote that, uh, that requires the selectmen to include a deed restriction in any sale that, that restricts its resale to an educational use. Um, I, I support uh, Mr. Warden's amendment, which does not change the substance of what the selectmen have proposed, and, and I'm frankly uh, puzzled by their opposition to his amendment for that reason. Um, all it does is, is strengthen precisely what they've said they want to say in the deed and ensure that, that it is in the deed and, it's, and that it is for the maximum length of time um, for which a deed restriction such as this can be recorded in Massachusetts, which is 30 years. Um, um, that a, such a deed restriction can also be re-recorded at the 30-year point and its life be extended beyond 30 years. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, suggest for, all the, for some of the reasons you've already heard that Mr. Bergen's, Mr. Berger's motion, while I think well-intentioned, um, is, is not effective. Um, a right of first refusal is an appropriate tool to try to control the resale of something, but it's not a tool that's really applicable to the immediate sale, um, to a transaction between the current owner and a next owner. It really has to do with the next owner and the owner after that, which is why a right of first refusal in favor of the town on a resale is included in the selectman's vote and, and would be part of the deed restriction. So I urge um, a no vote on Mr. Berger's amendment, a, um, a yes vote on uh, Mr. Warden's amendment, and uh, a yes vote on the resulting motion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Rudeman. Okay, we have another motion to terminate debate on all matters before the article. Uh, it's been seconded. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. In my opinion, it is a two-thirds vote. Okay, we have before us the now main motion of the selectmen, which was handed out and dated May 11th. We have Mr. Berger's amendment and Mr. Um, Warden's amendment. First, we're going to vote on Mr. Berger's amendment, then we're going to vote on Mr. Warden, then we're going to vote on the main, main motion. <clears throat> okay, all in, all in favor of Mr. Berger's amendment, please say yes. Opposed say no. No. Okay, my opinion is defeated. We now have before us Mr. Warden's amendment. All in favor of Mr. Warden's amendment, please say yes. Yes. Opposed say no. No. In my opinion, it, in my opinion, it is an affirmative vote. We have now before us the main motion of the Board of Selectmen as amended by Mr. Warden. This requires a two-third vote. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. Okay. Um, 
In my opinion, that is a two-thirds vote. We don't need that standing, correct, Juliana? Yep. Well, they're going to stand anyways. Yeah? Yes, exactly. All right, all in favor, please rise. Same tell us as before. Ms. Mahan, how many down front? 11. Mr. Schlickman, how many to my left? 23. Mr. Tremblay, how many in the right center? 25. Mr. O'Connor? 30 in the left center. And Mr. McCabe? 36 in, in the right. All opposed, please rise. Zero up front. Mr. Schlickman. Thirteen. Mr. O'Connor. Eleven. Mr. Trembley. Fifteen. And Mr. McCabe. Five. It is a total of 125 in the affirmative, 44 in the negative, and it does pass. That's two thirds. I declare Article 39 to be closed. The next article before us is Article um, 49. Article 49, Mr. Tosti. Fellow town meeting members, I'd like to propose a substitute motion for the no action vote of the Board of Selectmen and Finance Committee. Uh, hopefully you've kept your town government reorganization committee uh, packet that was handed out a while ago. Uh, I would like to propose uh, the submission of the Article 49 vote as stated in the uh, Town Government Reorganization Committee. Uh, if people haven't, uh, haven't saved yeah. that, um, hopefully I can read it too. Yep, seconded. Um, I, I'll take it, but I have one. Oh, time. It's on page seven of the town government reorganization report. Charlie, did you want? Oh, go ahead. I was asking if Mr. Foskett wanted to speak as well. Just you? Did he? Both. Mr. Moderator, I'd be happy to, to read it quickly if, if yep. that's needed. I got you, Mr. Foskett. If, go ahead. If you want to read it, go ahead. Okay, voted that the town, uh, that the town uh, economic advisory committee be in hereby as established said group to be charged with the responsibility consistent with the town manager act and all other applicable laws of making recommendations to town officials, appropriate elected boards and committees and town meeting regarding national state and local economic and financial issues affecting the town of Arlington. The membership of said committee shall consist of the following nine persons the town manager, the superintendent of schools, the director of assessments, town treasurer, chairman of the finance committee, two former Arlington town officials with executive level experience, and two residents of the town with private sector uh, executive level experience to be appointed by the town moderator. The names of all appointees shall be forwarded to the town clerk's office by the appointing authority no later than 30 days 
from the date of uh, adjournment of the 2011 annual town meeting. The town moderator shall act as temporary chair with the responsibility of scheduling the date, time, and location of the organization meeting of said group shall designate a qualified person to serve as secretary to the group. This was the fourth and last recommendation from the town government reorganization committee. Um, primarily, uh, we have a lot of commissions and committees and, and such that look at sort of the next year and look at you know, the five-year plans and, and various elements like that, the capital plan. We don't have a, a group that perhaps looks beyond that. Look at the economic situation or changes that might occur which could affect Arlington, maybe not this year, but down the road. Uh, and this group would strive to develop some uh, with relationships with various boards. Uh, this group would have no public policy authority or power. It's only authority is to make recommendations to the various groups within the town that it feels uh, are relevant. Uh, nothing in this Warren article establishing this group shall be construed as preempting the authority or diminishing the statutory prerogatives of the Board of Selectmen, Town Treasurer, Collector, Clerk, Assessors, Town Manager, or the Superintendent of Schools. Um, so that, that's basically it. It's fairly simple. It's creating a group, uh, receives no pay, uh, that simply meets periodically and look, tries to look ahead and bring up issues which might not be in the one-year vision of what people are looking at now. Uh, therefore, I'd recommend the proposed substitute motion to you and hope you'll give it favorable consideration and be happy to answer any questions. Uh, now, I'm speaking as chair of the Town Government Reorganization Committee. Remember, I go to the central mic if I'm from the Finance Committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Jones. Hi, my name is Alan Jones. I'm from Precinct 14. I'm the vice chair of the Finance Committee, and if that microphone was working, I should probably be standing over there according to custom, but be that as may. Um, as reported in the Finance Committee report, the Finance Committee voted unanimously to recommend no action on Article 49. The committee believes that the objectives of the motion are already met by existing committees, including Vision 2020, the Budget and Revenue Task Force, the Capital Planning Committee, the Long-Term Planning Committee, and to a lesser extent, the Committee on Tourism and Economic Development, the Finance Committee, the Planning Department, the Town Manager, Board of Selectmen, School Committee, Additional Committee. Would add little value to that, but just take away more time from all the uh, staff and volunteers who already work on all these other committees. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Foskett. Oh, pass. Mr. Jameson? Okay. Is that seconded? Yeah, you guys who moved the question, got to come up to the mic. Introduce yourself like everybody else. Name, precinct, rank. Okay, we have motion to terminate debate. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. In my opinion, it is a two-third vote. Um, we have before us the substitute vote of the Town Economic Advisor, what, what the heck, Town Government Reorganization Committee um, to set up a committee. All in favor, please say yes. yes. Opposed, say no. No. My opinion, that's a negative vote. We now have before us the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen for no action. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. It's recommended no action. My opinion, that closes Article 48. We are now to Article 50, 52, revolving funds. Um, anyone wish to speak to revolving funds? Someone going to introduce it? Thank you. 
No. To the facility, uh, and the uh, expenditures are not to exceed fifteen thousand dollars. If we can get that much uh, for improvements, otherwise, it's the standard uh, renewal. Mr. Jamison. Yeah, after you just, yeah, why don't you just bend that mic down until we get it fixed? Yeah, there we go. Okay, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamison, Precinct Four. 12. Um, I did discuss this uh, briefly, this article briefly with the uh, Deputy Town Manager. I wanted to point out a couple things to the body. Um, uh, these, these monies total about set three quarters of a million dollars a year in receipts, of, at least by my count. Um, and on the three biggest items, and on the one that's being added, I had a couple quick questions if I think maybe the deputy town manager might address those since I had discussed, or Mr. Sullivan, um, whichever. We'll, well figure. Put, put your question to the... Well, um, let's start with the life support rescue one. What's your question? Um, I have some questions about the utilizations of the funds last year and plans for this, this year and going forward. Um. So it's my understanding that some of these funds were utilized, I think most appropriately, to cover some of the fire department's costs that were overruns last year, is that correct? Um, they are ambulance related expenses, is that what you're referring to, the ambulance I, fund? Yes, do we mean related to fire department costs from the previous years when, you, when the budget was closed out, which is part of this, because this is last year's ending. Right, um, FY10, and, yes. And, and yes, and these are all related to fire department expenses uh, for ambulance service. Okay, so but did cover some of their deficit. Yes. Okay. Um, I note that uh, you have some use in the past and the current going forward towards the capital plan to cover the cost of the rescue, uh, I should assume the equipment. Yes. Uh, capital equipment. That's mm -hmm. good. I'd like to see more of that. Okay. Um, you also, I believe, in the FY12 budget um, are covering some costs, some, some firemen, at least proposed as based upon the back of the finance committee. There's a thing that said two firemen are going to be covered by the, the uh, ambulance fund, the rescue fund. Uh, that's correct. We're proposing to operate a second ambulance, and those additional uh, staff people will be charged to the revolving fund. Okay, and the uh, expenditures not to exceed will still be fine in the receipts uh, with those additional receipts that you anticipate? Yes. And uh, you're covering the cost of those two employees. Does it cover the cost of their health care insurance and pension costs? I don't believe in the first year, although uh, we'll certainly make sure it does in the second year. That would be great. We always like to see things covering uh, the full, full boat there, so to speak. Um, thank you on that one. On the town hall rental, um, does that cover capital costs or is that just sort of like a working capital thing for expenditures incurred renting this building out to uh, different uh, good purposes? It covers more uh, maintenance items as opposed to capital improvements. Okay. So smaller, like redoing floors, lighting systems, uh, that type of thing. It helps fund those things. And, and those in the library, if we, we do rugs and stuff are part of the capital plan, these are exempt from that use? Um, could qualify whether there's enough in there to cover that large of an item. Okay, yeah, does it cover employees' costs at all? Yes, it does. Uh, I, I, I was surprised a couple years to learn that even part-time employees pay into the pension plan. So in the future, similar to my previous comment, it'd be nice if the pension costs were also covered. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and last, um, oh, I make, I'll make a comment so I don't have to get up later. Um, the Recycling Committee volunteered to have its $3,000 taken out of the, one more, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, one, one more, uh, take $3,000 appropriation taken out of the committee budget, which we'll get to later or after we get back from uh, or the override. Um, and that's going to be taken out of the white goods or recycling, uh, Article 35 fund instead at the uh, discretion of the, the uh, Director of Public Works. And we think that's a nice way for us to not use as much town funds to continue our good work there. And that's in my respect, my capacity as a co-chair of the Recycling Committee. And last question was the same capital type question on the chapel, chapel fund that you're creating here. Would that be a capital funds or just the repair type thing? Uh, more repair. Yeah, we're not going to get enough money to cover any significant uh, improvements to it, so this is more in the nature of repairs. Okay, obviously I, I'm going to vote in favor of this, and I, I urge the body to do so, and I'm very pleased with the increased utilization of these monies to cover expenses that normally would have come, previously had come out of the general funds, and I urge the manager and his uh, deputy to continue good works in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Warden. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Warden, Precinct 8. I just have a question. 
It's on the uh, on page uh, 26 of the Sleitman's report. The second uh, item uh, is the, the library vend. Can you tell us what that means in regular English? Thank you. I believe that's just a library vending machine. Any, uh, yes. Okay, anybody else wish to speak to the, um, the article? Seeing none. We have before us a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen to reauthorize revolving funds. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. My opinion is a unanimous vote. That brings us next to Article 53, CBD, CDGB applications. The Board of Selectmen gave us a um, nice supplement the other day, May 11th. Ms. McCourt, you want to speak to it? Um, so you should have before you the CDBG um, budget um, this is a budget which is controlled by the Board of Selectmen. We ask for your endorsement every year. Um, the committee that determines how these funds will be distributed consists of myself and Mr. Dunn. Um, this is a committee that Jack Hurd sat on with me for many years. And um, I'm going to take the opportunity to mention how wonderful it was to serve with Jack and um, what a great job he did of upholding our community's values on this particular um, uh, piece of work that we did every year. Um, there is one small change to the distribution as um, you have in your budget, and that is that it was pointed out to us that there is a federal rule um, that allows us to take what's called program income from any program that is actually earning income and move it into the public services um, budget, which is otherwise restricted to 15% of the total allocation that we can take 15% of that program income and add it here. We were able to do that this year. And so we have increased the contribution to Arlington High School athletic scholarships. We see this as bridging from this year to next year when we're hoping that the um, income they'll be earning from selling advertising will fill in this gap and allow them to cover um, more scholarships for the students. Um, this is money that the high school students will have to be um, income eligible under the HUD program to receive. Um, so we'll see how that goes this year. Um, you would need to add $35,000, therefore, to line two H A H S uh, athletic scholarships, moving that from $8,000 to $43,000, and uh, subsequently modifying your subtotals. Um, so there are two sections of this budget that, as I said, are restricted. One is public services, which can only be 15% of the allotment with that exception I just described. And the other is administrative costs, which is restricted to the amount that you see here. I believe it's 20% of the allocation. Otherwise, we're able to distribute the money between rehabilitation, housing, and public facilities and improvements um, as we choose. And these are the choices that we've made this year. And I hope that you will see fit to endorse. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Come on. Yes. Fitzgerald, that's her name. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Ann Fitzgerald, Precinct 17. I am the outgoing chair of the Council on Aging, who requested me to speak to the um, reduction that we received this year from the CDBG funds. And we are hoping at some point to address the um, selectmen's meeting uh, to see if we can ask that we have at least uh, $18,000 restored. As you may not be aware of uh, the Dial-A-Ride program and the VAN program provides frail elder uh, in Arlington with rides to the doctors, to the grocery store, to get their essential business done. 
and we rely heavily on the CDBG funds to help us. We do have a few other funds, a Sanborn Cancer Fund, which reimburses the COA for the um, rides provided. For example, if you have a full treatment for cancer, you probably would need, if it was radiation, you would probably need at least 28 rides. So the Sanborn Fund will reimburse the cost to the COA. There are currently over 9,500 seniors residing in Arlington. Many are over 70, and many at 80 have usually been either forced or uh, reluctantly give up their license to drive. So that means that in order to stay independent and to, um, in some cases, to remain at home, they need the support from the COA. Um, we know that this is, um, that we cannot change um, what the selectmen have already, they've already decided, but we would ask that in future they um, could see if there a possibility of um, giving us back the funds. We initially asked for 70,000. If you do the math and reduce it by 16.7%, which is um, what, the, what Congress reduced the funds to, it would be 58,300 as opposed to the 4,000, the 40,000, excuse me. So we're um, just bringing this to your attention and um, as a selectman here tonight, um, but my board did request this, so I am, I am making this request for them as well. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. Uh, almost in teacher mode here because of sat through so many of these CDBG uh, applications. I'd just like to ask a couple of questions of the selectmen just to put it on the record so the meeting has an understanding of where we are and what this is about. Does the town meeting as the legislature of the town have a say in what is uh, appropriate under CDBG? No. Uh, so basically in endorsing it, we're basic, the, the vote before us is do we want to accept federal money, is that right? Well, they're more or less uh, looking uh, I for believe our so, yes. blessing. And, I, and so we're looking for your blessing, is correct. And what happens, let's say hypothetically, if we didn't bless it? Um, I don't know. Ms. Rice, Nothing. do you know? Nothing, as far as I know. It's no consequence? No consequence. So essentially, we're debating a moot article, aren't we? Excuse me? Uh, uh, well, no, they come to us <laughs> as an informatory mode to tell right. us what they're I, doing. I feel that, that as the appropriating body of the town, you should know what we're doing with the money. It sort of fits into the whole financial plan, and that the request for endorsement, I, in my opinion, it matters to me whether or not you're willing to endorse, mm -hmm. but you know, I can't tell you that the, the effectiveness of that endorsement is different than it is. So basically, the options before the meeting right now are to either endorse and say, yes, we'd like to have this wonderful federal money, or no, not to endorse it, and we'll still apply for the federal money. I got uh, you, John. With, with a little less blessing attached to it and maybe a negative consequence the next time the Congress looks to appropriate in our direction. Right, and if I were going to be on the Board of Selectmen next year and I was going to be chairing this committee again, I would take seriously your complaints. Oh, okay, thank you very much. So uh, I urge uh, I urge a rapid affirmative <laughs> response is basically the only thing we should do under this article. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sweeney. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, John Sweeney, Precinct 13. I had a couple of questions 
about the planning entry in the supplemental report. Uh, first question is, are these new positions or just a uh, continuation of old uh, positions? These are the continuation of existing positions. I see. And every year it's funded from the CB CDBG, CD? yes. Uh, I'd just like uh, to point out that it's about 12% of the, the total, uh, but that answers my question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Kleinman? Man, that's annoying. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Martin. Stuart Kleinman, um, Precinct 1. Um, to begin, as somebody who has um, written many federal grants and somebody who sometimes goes to Washington to review federal grant applications, I must say it looks better if we endorse it. If you submit it without our endorsement, well, the feds may say, well, you know, why don't your town meeting, why don't your government endorse the application? Um, that's one point. The other question I have is, um, do we know, will we receive all of this money? Um, what is the difference between last year and this year in terms of percentage? Mr. Court? Um, it was a 16% reduction. Okay. Now, the word on the street, because I actually get some mm -hmm. CDBG money now, is that there's a 22% cut. Now, I didn't know, because things are really weird in Washington. Do we know? <laughs> no, I, I believe it was a 16 or 16 and a half percent cut. There was some supplemental CDBG funds under the Stimulus Act that we are also not getting, and perhaps that's where the 22 percent number comes from, but that was like totally separate and spent separately and not to be repeated. Okay. Well, thanks. And, um, mm -hmm. and, I, and to be honest, I really wouldn't change anything because we're in kind of very strange times here, and thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. LaCourt, you are next on the list if you still want to be. Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to um, respond to Ms. Fitzgerald's concerns. Um, we know that we have shorted the, the transportation program a little bit. There's some flux in that account right now. We're not really sure how the billing is working, but the town manager has set aside $30,000 in reserve funds for us to tap if we need it to support those programs over the course of this fiscal year. Did I get that correct, Mr. Sullivan? It's in the Finance Committee Reserve Fund. So we will ensure that um, uh, those funds are available for our uh, senior citizens who need them. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Dunn? Pass. Pass. Mr. Deist? Pass. Pass. Mr. Warden? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Warden, Precinct. Um, Eight. Um, I, I, I had a question for, I, I guess, to you, uh, to Ms. LaCourt. Uh, I didn't see where the, where the, 30, the $35,000 uh, uh, was, uh, was coming out of. Or did, did I miss it? Um, we had uh, program income in the Arlington Home Improvement Loan Program, yeah. and we are allowed to take 15% of that program income and move it into public services, which is what we did. There was so, it, about so, so it's not out of this year's appropriation? It's not out of this year's appropriation. It's out of accumulated funds in okay. that program. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, the, the, uh, the other point, uh, and this is a somewhat ancient history, uh, but I remember an evening uh, in this hall when uh, uh, Ms. Mahan, when she was not in the exalted role she now holds but was just a town meeting like, member like the rest of us, um, was very concerned that, that the uh, selectmen uh, had uh, chopped out of the uh, appropriation uh, a program for deletting some units at uh, one of the housing authority projects. Mm -hmm. Maybe Ms. Mahan will remember it better than I. Mm -hmm. And she got up here and proposed an amendment that we take some money from somewhere in this program and put it into that deletting uh, program, and uh, it was approved by this meeting. So I, I just wonder if we, perhaps we don't have a little leverage there. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm not sure how that would have worked, but okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Fiore? Thank you. 
Chelsea Fury, Precinct 2. Uh, in the early days when we got CDBG money, if I have the order correct, uh, we used to uh, meet with our former planning director, Mr. McLennan, and he would invite people to sit and, and go, uh, go over the uh, different departments and things that were going to be receiving money and people would make comments and so forth. But it seems to me now that it sounds like there's only two people doing this and it's certainly a lot of work and I'm not one of those that would be able to sit that long, I don't think. So my question simply is if the public, uh, you know, members of the town meeting, for instance, wanted to sit in on these discussions and, and offer any suggestions, uh, is that possible? I know, the, I know you advertise the hearing, so I see those. And I know that, you know, I see in the paper when it comes in. But I would like to know if it would be published, if people could sit in on it. Thank you. Well, Ms. LaCourt? I, I believe at the public hearing that we hold on the applications and also on the, uh, during the discussion that we have about how the programs have worked over the course of a year, that that's the appropriate point for input from the public. On, uh, because we're allotting these funds based on applications that we get, okay? So we, we first of all, can only consider um, the applications we've received, and those applications have to meet certain criteria um, with regards to the federal requirements. And so if we deem that something meets those federal requirements and that their application is correct, then that goes on a list for consideration. And so that's, we, we start by being limited by those applications, but it's at the public hearing point that input would be what would be useful to us because that's when we have the full board to consider it. I mean, it's not like the subcommittee doesn't take direction from the rest of the board and doesn't listen to that public hearing as the starting point for our decision-making process. It's really just that then we're kind of dickering amongst um, all of those applications we've received to try to decide you know, what kind of program survive if we don't give them their full uh, request? Will they still be able to make use of those funds? Um, you know, is there some new request? Do we think it has merit? Is it worth funding some other program we've been supporting for years a little bit less? Those kinds of decisions we tend to do in the subcommittee. So does that help? You're welcome. Mr. Wagner? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. Uh, I move the previous question and all associated matters. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Motion to terminate debate. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. That's a two-third vote. We have before us a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen for endorsement of the CD, CDBG application. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That disposes of the article. We have now before us Article 54, Collective Bargaining. FinCom will report. Mr. Tosti. I guess I lied before when I said I'd go to the central mic as chair of the FinCom. Um, from now on, we're, we're pretty much into the Finance Committee report. And at this point, I would usually give up, uh, get up and give a long spiel, taking a few pieces from the chairman's report and a few of the charts in the back. Um, but I, I don't think I'll do that. I think you've read my chairman's report. Hopefully, you see the things that are, are going on. Um, you've looked at the five-year plan in the back, um, the cuts that are listed, at least on the town side. And again, you, you've seen the uh, listing of all the members of the Finance Committee who have worked very hard over the last several months and are still working hard um, to get the rest of the information for you. Um, so if you have questions, see me at the break uh, or give me a call, numbers in the book. On Article 54, what I would like to do, um, and, and some of these I'll get up and just say a couple words and others, if you don't have any questions, I won't bother. A few of the articles I will table or move to postpone <coughs> because um, they're either small things, uh, we can get them out of the way, they're not gonna change whether there's an override or non-override, and I think we can get a large percentage of the rest of these articles done and uh, adjourn until uh, June 8th after the override. Um, 
Of course, the final decision is up to you. On Article 54, I would like to move to table this article. <laughs> the manager is in the process of negotiations. Uh, you've heard of the uh, breakthrough um, contract that we've gotten with the teachers, which of course won't come before you, um, and the manager is now working with the other unions. So I think uh, with a little luck, hopefully by the time we come back on the 8th, um, he will have some collective bargaining contracts uh, for you to review. So I move to table Article 54. It's been seconded. All in favor of tabling Article 54, please say yes. yes. <laughs> Opposed? It is tabled. That brings us to Article 55, position reclassification. We have before us to recommend a vote of the FINCOM. Any questions? Anyone would like to speak to position reclassifications? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed, say no. Unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That brings us, the article is closed. That brings us to Article 56. Budgets. Why don't I just say table? Uh, <clears throat> a couple weeks ago, I, I put forth uh, to get opinions from various town officials, the moderators, manager, superintendent, uh, various other people, and I put forth three proposals. And I got back about eight different responses. So what I would like to do is move to postpone uh, the town budgets until June 8th after the override. I get more and more, I become convinced that if we vote this now, we're going to basically doing the same debate twice. Um, so therefore, I, I move to uh, uh, postpone until June 8th. Okay. Um, all in favor of postponing till June 8th, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. no. It is postponed to June 8th. May 6th, postponed to 6 8. Okay, that brings us to Article 57 we already voted on. That brings us to Article 58. Um, article 58 is a no action because we have already taken action on this same article at the special town meeting. All in favor of recommend vote on no action, please say yes. 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 Opposed say no. It's a unanimous vote for no action. If you can have such a thing, that closes the article. We're on to number 59. Appropriations, financing, construction, or reconstruction of sore and sore ridge facilities. We have before us to recommend a vote of the Finance Committee. Anyone wish to discuss this article? Okay. This requires two thirds because we're borrowing money. All in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed, say no. It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Ms. Um, Lucarelli, are two, uh, 85 town meeting members present and voting? Yes. yes. Thank you. Nine, unanimous. That brings us to Article 60, appropriation finance of construction or reconstruction of water mains and water facilities. Anyone wish to discuss this article? No one. Okay, again, borrowing. All in favor of the article and recommend a vote of the FinCom, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. Unanimous vote, and I so declare. Ms. Um, Lucarelli, 85 town meeting members present and voting. Yes. Okay, thank you. That brings us to Article 62. We already did 60, that was Minutemen. We have a force recommend a vote of the FinCom appropriation for committees and commissions. They want us to give um, $14,760 to all these various folks. Anyone wish to discuss this? Seeing none. Uh, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. Okay, that's a majority vote. We have a force article 63 to recommend a vote for celebrations $10,167 to the various parades and celebrations. All in, anyone wish to discuss this? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed, say no. no. Majority vote. We have before us Article 64, appropriation miscellaneous. Some $11,040 appropriated for legal defense, out of state travel, indemnification, and medical costs. Anyone wish to discuss this article? Seeing none. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. Majority so, and I so declare it. That closes the article. Article 65. We have before us a recommended vote of no action. Oops. All in favor of no action, please say yes. Yes. 
opposed? No action on Article 65. Article 66, uh, recommended water bodies. I want to do $20,000 for the water bodies. Anyone wish to discuss this, treating, maintaining, and oversight of our ponds and rivers? Okay, no one wants to discuss it. All in favor of the recommended vote of the FinCom, please say yes. Yes. All opposed say no. Unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Article 67, appropriations for adjustment of former 25-year accidental disability employees. We have before us a recommended vote of the FinCom for a sum of zero dollars. Okay. Anyone wish to discuss this? No one. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. That's a unanimous vote. We have before us Article 68. Appropriation. Mr. Moderator? Yes, sir. Uh, I would like to make a motion to postpone uh, this article until June 8th. Um, if the override is successful or other sums of money might become available, we, we might want to amend this. Uh, we'll have a better idea over the next couple of weeks. Therefore, I move to postpone till June 8th. Okay, we have. Uh, we're going to post. Uh, we have a motion to postpone Article 58 to June 8th, and it's been seconded. 6 8. 68. Article 68. <laughs> 6 8 2 6 8. Cool. All right, all in favor of postponement, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? It is postponed. Um, postponed 69. We have a recommended vote of no action. All in favor, no Mr. action. Uh, oh. uh, Mr. Moderator, Sir. I would like to uh, move to postpone this until June 8th. As, you could, as the town meeting can see, part of the, um, our deliberations uh, was based on the fact that um, you know, there was no COLA raises being given town employees. And so the Finance Committee would like the opportunity to revisit this. We might keep it the same because even with the uh, contracts that could be in place, there would still be no um, COAs for fiscal 2010 and fiscal 2011, but we want the opportunity to revisit in light of the contracts uh, that have been negotiated and could be negotiated. So therefore, I move to postpone until 6-8. Motion to postpone Article 69 to June 8th. All in favor, please say yes. yes. Opposed, say no. That's postponed. Uh, Article 70. Acceptance of legislation to increase or increase of survivors' benefits. We have before us a recommended vote of the FinCom. Anyone wish to discuss this article? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. yes. Opposed, say no. It's unanimous vote. Disposed of the article. We have now before us Article 71, local option taxes. We have a recommended vote of no action. Anyone wish to discuss it? None. All in favor of no action, please say yes. Yes. We have before us now Article 72. Well, no one wants to vote against it. It's no action. All right. Who doesn't want to take no action? No one. It's unanimous vote. No action. <laughs> Article 72. We have a force appropriation for tips fee stabilization. Uh, recommended vote of 450000 being hereby is appropriated from the Tip fee stabilization fund. Anyone wish to discuss tip fee stabilization? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. It's unanimous vote, I so declare it. Ms. Rainville is Ms. Rainville, I'm sorry. Ms. Lucarelli, 85 members present and voting. Yes. 73. Transfer from the cemetery funds. Anyone wish to discuss cemetery fund transfer? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. yes. Opposed, say no. Unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Ms. Lucarelli, are 85 members present in voting? Thank you. She rec said yes. Number 74, Appropriation Overlay Reserve Fund. Some 200,000 being here by appropriated to the Overlay Reserve Surplus Account. Anyone wish to discuss overlay funds? Seeing none, all in favor of recommend a vote, please say yes. yes. All opposed? Unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Ms. Lucarelli, are 85 members present in voting? Yes. yes. She answers in the affirmative. That disposes of Article 74. Article 75, appropriation to stabilize. Mr. Moderator? Yes, sir. Uh, I move to postpone this till June 8th. Um, obviously, if the override is successful and passes, we'll need this article to put money 
uh, from that override into the stabilization fund uh, as we did with the 2005 override and then they'll be built up and then drawn down. So I move to uh, postpone until June 8th. All in favor of postponement to June 8th, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Okay, it is postponed to June 8th. That brings us to free cash, my favorite. Sum of eight. $385,249 be used to determine the tax rate. Do you want to change this one, Mr. Tosti? We are good. Anyone wish to discuss free cash? No one. Um, all in favor, please, of the recommended vote of Finance Committee, please say yes. yes. Opposed, say no. no. It is a majority vote. And if my calculations are right, hold on. Everything else has been postponed or tabled. Yep, thank you, Mr. Warden. Sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Warden, Precinct 8. It uh, strikes me that we're, we're about done as far as we can go. Correct. Uh, but we moved, uh, we voted earlier in the evening to adjourn until next Wednesday. Wednesday, we're going to have to change that. We need to reconsider that vote unless we don't want to come back next Wednesday for nothing, I guess. Correct. Thank you. So, Ms. Rowe, can you get up and make a motion to reconsider our vote on the lines of Mr. Warden's recommendations? Yes, uh, Mr. Moderator, it is moved that if all the business of the meeting is set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of it. This session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, June 8th, 2011, at 8, 8 p.m. Okay, I'm going to treat that as a motion for reconsideration of our earlier vote and put that in there. So all in favor of adjourning to June 8th, please say yes. 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 Opposed, say no. We are adjourned to June 8th. Are there any notices of reconsideration? Mr. Schlickman.